Hello, true crimeers. Let's just get right into it. You're basically, uh, you know what this is going to be. This is going to be another compilation video. Uh, you will have another full-length true crime story tomorrow. Don't worry. So, this is going to be, I think I did 21, if I counted correctly. I almost never do. Uh, 21 more cases where people are killed by their own flesh and blood. Their own family. Ugh. Anyway, without further ado, viewer discretion is advised. Rattle, rattle, jingle, jingle, says the dog. Sleepwalking. I'm sure we all know someone who's done it, right? Some sleepwalkers do silly things. But what about... Murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Scott Filater. Viewer discretion is advised. Scott was married to Yarmila, and they had two children, Michael and Megan. The family lived happily in this home in Phoenix, Arizona. Scott was an engineer for Motorola. Yarmila was a preschool teacher. They were known as a really just happy, loving couple. There was never allegations of, like, physical abuse. Neither parent was cheating on each other. The finances were solid. Their two children, and even neighbors and friends and family, would say they never even saw the couple fight. And that's why everyone was so baffled and blindsided by what happened. On January 16th, 1997, the Filater's next-door neighbor would call 911. The neighbor would say, and I quote, the husband just threw, I believe, the wife into the pool. It looked like he's holding her underwater. Police arrived within minutes. No one was answering the door when they knocked, so they actually hopped over the neighbor's wall to go to the backyard, where they saw Yarmila floating in the pool. They pulled her out, and first responders were not able to help her. The pool was also full of blood. Yarmila wasn't drowned. She was stabbed to death. Not once or twice. 44 times. The police enter the home where the two children are safe and sound and still sleeping. And Scott is in a perfectly clean white shirt and plaid pajama bottoms. He is immediately handcuffed. He claims he went to bed around 9.30, maybe 10 o'clock. And the next thing he knows, he's waking up to people pointing guns at him. And his wife, dead. The neighbor, whose name is Greg... He said he actually saw Scott go back into the house after seeing him put Yarmela in the pool. And it looked like he was just sort of getting stuff done. Possibly changing clothes. That he just seemed very alert and aware of what he was doing. During Scott's interrogation, the detective noticed something. Scott had traces of blood on his ear. But nowhere else. He obviously cleaned himself up, but he missed a spot. He and his defense would claim he's a sleepwalker. He was under a lot of stress. His own defense said, we know he did the killing, but it wasn't intentional. He was asleep. He had sleepwalking issues as a kid, but he changed his clothes. He opened the door to let the dog out. He put a band-aid on a cut on his hand. He did things that required being alert. He just got caught. There is no real motive. That's never been discovered. The jury didn't buy the BS. He was convicted and sentenced to life without parole. A family of six would be gunned down in this house on Christmas Eve by the people they loved. Hello, true crimeers. It is time for another Christmas murder story. And this is the case of the Carnation Christmas Eve murders. Viewer discretion is advised. This is a street in Carnation, Washington State, which is about 25 miles east of Seattle. It's a pretty small town, actually. It only has about 2,000 people living in it. And in that town lived the Anderson family. Wayne and Judy Anderson have been married for about 31 years. Judy worked for the post office. Wayne was an engineer. They had three kids together, one of them being Scott. Another one was Michelle. And then they had another daughter named Mary. 32-year-old Scott was married to 32-year-old Erica. And the two of them had two kids, Olivia and Nathan. And Michelle was dating a man by the name of Joseph McEnroe. And the Anderson family lived on a 10-acre property. On Christmas Eve 2007, Wayne and Judy had planned a nice family gathering. 
They were decorated. Everyone was happy, excited for the holiday. The kids were excited for Santa to come. The two people who were not present in the home that night were Michelle and her boyfriend, Joseph. But they would soon make their appearance. The two of them would burst into the door, each one of them holding a handgun. Michelle would fire a shot at her father, Wayne, while he was just relaxing reading the newspaper. She missed and it went through a window. Then her gun jammed. So then Joseph approached Wayne and shot him dead. And then he turned to Judy and shot her dead too. They would then take their bodies and drag them out. They hid them in a shed and they waited because Scott, Erica, and the two kids hadn't actually arrived at the home yet. About an hour after they killed the parents, the rest of the family entered the home. Both Michelle and Joseph basically came out of the shadows and started firing at all of them, including the two children. Scott was shot four times until he died. Erica managed to call 911 around five o'clock. She could be heard screaming on the phone, not the kids, and then the phone went dead. They shot Erica twice, killing her. Michelle's gun ran out of bullets, so she tells Joseph to shoot the two kids, who are both clinging on to their dead parents. So he does. He shoots them both and kills them. Within hours, police arrived, and for some reason, Michelle just confessed. She just totally caved. Why did she do it? Her brother owed her $40,000 and wasn't paying her back, and she was tired of being stepped on by the family. They both got six life sentences. Hmm. When investigators entered the South African home of this family on January 27th, 2015, four of these people would be lying in a pool of their own blood. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Van Breda family. Viewer discretion is advised. The Van Breda family consisted of the father, Martin, the mom, Teresa, and their three children, Rudy, Marley, and Henry. The family was living in Stellenbosch, South Africa. They had actually lived in Australia for a time, but then in 2014, they all ventured back to South Africa. This was a very wealthy family. The family, by all accounts, was in good graces with each other. There didn't appear to be any bad blood, any negative energy around them, but apparently there must have been. On the night of January 27, 2015, while the family was asleep, Someone was in their home, possibly an intruder, and he was wielding an axe. The entire family was asleep upstairs, and most of the valuables in the home were on the lower level. The story that one of the sons gave, this is Henry, was that he suddenly saw a tall black man in the doorway of his bedroom. He was wearing dark clothing, gloves, a mask. Henry and his brother Rudy shared a bedroom, and according to Henry, this intruder just started to go to town with an ax on his brother, Rudy. Henry says he went to hide in the bathroom. Apparently all the commotion woke up the rest of the family. Martin went into the room and then he was attacked by the ax and killed. Teresa goes into the room. She's attacked by the man with an ax and killed. And then Marley in her own room is allegedly attacked by the same man with an ax, but she survived. Henry claims he got into a brief altercation with this intruder. He said the intruder was maniacally laughing the whole time, but Henry only got a couple of scratches on him, all superficial wounds. The intruder leaves, and then Henry decides to call his girlfriend first. Then, allegedly, Henry passes out on the stairs for three hours, and then wakes up to call police, where his phone call was really calm. Police got to the house, there was blood everywhere. The thing about Henry's story, about saying he was in the bathroom, he had blood splatter all over his socks and shorts. Blood that matched his family. Meaning he was there when the splatter happened. The house was very secure. They had a security system. It wasn't tripped. There was no sign of forced entry. Henry would be arrested for the murders of his family. He tried to recreate the attack in court, but most people didn't buy it. He was found guilty of all three murders and got life in prison without parole. Why did he do it? That's the biggest issue. Police found no motive. Just a few hours after this photo was taken, two of these people would be dead. Hello, true crimers. This is the case 
of the Whitaker family. Viewer discretion is advised. On December 10th, 2003, the Whitaker family, who lived in Houston, Texas, will go out to Papa Do's Seafood Restaurant. And this was to celebrate one of their sons, Bart. He was graduating school. Bart was graduating from Sam Houston State University. Woohoo! They ate a wonderful dinner and they took pictures. So this is Bart with his younger brother, Kevin. And then on that same night, Bart and Kevin with their mother, Patricia. And uh, when dinner wrapped up, they headed back home. The family would pull up to their house. Patricia, Kevin, and the father, Kent, were all walking towards the door. Bart was lagging a little behind because he was checking his cell phone messages. Kevin walked in the house first, and then a gunshot. Kevin was shot in the chest. Patricia, soon behind him, was shot in the chest. The father, Kent, he rushed in and was shot in the shoulder. Bart, hearing the commotion, ran inside the house. He began having some sort of altercation with the shooter when the gun went off and Bart was also shot through the arm. The masked assailant then took off from the house. And in his wake, Kevin and Patricia were dead. Kent and Bart both survived their gunshot wounds. The police arrived with three people lying in the entryway. There were spent bullets on the ground. Police suspected that it was a robber who had been casing the neighborhood in the days prior, but it had to have been someone random who just got caught in the act of burglarizing, unless it wasn't. After the story was publicized, a news writer would uncover something concerning. Bart, he never finished college. He wasn't attending Sam Houston State College. He spent his tuition money on fun stuff and just skipped school. And then a man named Adam Hip came forward, who told police that Bart tried to hire him in 2001 to murder his family. Obviously, it never happened. Now, police checked Adam Hip, and he had an alibi for the night of the family's murder. Police were then led to two of Bart's co-workers, Chris Brashear and Stephen Champagne. But it wouldn't be until a year after where Champagne admitted that Bart hired them to kill his family. Chris Brashear was the shooter. He hid in the house while the family was at dinner, and Bart never paid them their money. Brashear did it for the insurance money. Ultimately, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Brashear also got life, and Stephen Champagne got 15 years. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Hello, Drew Kramerers. This is the highly requested case of Lizzie Borden. Viewer discretion? Guess what? It's advised. Lizzie was born on July 19th, 1860. Damn, you an old bitch. Her father was Andrew Jackson Borden. Fun fact, did you know that Lizzie's middle name is Andrew? Ha! <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Lizzie's birth mother, Sarah, she died in 1863, and Andrew didn't waste much time porking around. Three years after Sarah's death, he married this lady, Abby Durfee Gray, and then her last name would change to Borden. The family would live here in this home, and it's located in Fall River, Massachusetts. And yes, it is still there. Also living in the house was Lizzie's sister, Emma, and their live-in maid, Bridget Sullivan, and she was from Ireland. Bridget would later testify that there were a lot of tensions in the Borden house. The two girls, the sisters, would rarely eat dinner with the whole family. One day, Andrew Borden killed a whole bunch of pigeons with a hatchet, and that really pissed Abby off. And then a big argument happened, and Lizzie and her sister, they took a week away from the house. There was also a lot of issues with real estate. Andrew was extremely generous with his money and he purchased homes for family members, specifically his wife's family members. And he really wouldn't do that same thing with Lizzie. Sometime in the beginning of August of 1892, the entire household would become very, very sick, vomiting like crazy. They believed they were possibly poisoned. And then on the morning of August 4th, 1892, Lizzie Borden took an axe 
gave her mother 40 wax. And when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Abby and Andrew were both struck violently with an axe, an axe with no handle. This is the damage that happened to Abby's skull, and this is the skull of her father. For educational purposes, the only people in the home that day were Lizzie and Bridget, who was cleaning on the third floor. She claims she didn't hear anything, which is odd. Lizzie said she was out in the barn when the murders happened, but she would be arrested for the murders. When on trial, and a jury of 12 men found her not guilty. She bought this house and then died in 1927. But did Lizzie do it? Could it be the maid? Or a phantom? We'll never know. This appears to be a loving mother interacting with her daughter. But appearances are very deceiving. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of Mary Beth Tinning. Viewer discretion is advised. Mary Beth here was born on September 11th, 1942, and she was from Duanesburg, New York. There really isn't a whole lot of information about her growing up, just little pockets of information, like she claimed that her father, who fought in World War II, uh, abused her. She also claimed that relatives said that she was unloved and unwanted. But by all appearances, she just sort of grew up to be a relatively normal, relatively untalked about person. Just very plain. Mary Beth got married in 1965 and they had their first child, Barbara. In January 1970, their second child came along, Joseph Jr. By 1974, her marriage was a little rocky. And so she poisoned her husband, Joseph, by putting barbiturates in his grape juice. He survived, and it was revealed what she did, and he didn't press charges. Their third child, who was named Jennifer, she died after only being alive for a week. This was due to meningitis because of brain abscesses. Two weeks later, Joseph Jr. was brought to the hospital because he was having seizures. But a couple of days later, doctors would say, listen, we can't find out what's wrong with him, and he hasn't had any more seizures, so we're going to have him go home. A few hours after he was let out of the hospital, he would be brought back. This time, he was dead. He allegedly had cardiac arrest. On March 1st, they brought Barbara into the hospital. She was five, and she too appeared to be having seizures. She died a day later. Thanksgiving 1973, she would give birth to their next child, Timothy. By December 10th, Timothy was brought into the hospital, dead. There's a pattern here. They attributed his death to SIDS. 1975, their fifth child, Nathan, is born. Just a couple of months later, he's dead. August 1978, they adopt a child named Michael. A couple of months later, she gives birth to her next child, Mary Frances. A couple of months later, Mary Frances is dead. 1981, Michael falls down a flight of stairs. He dies. August 1985, Tammy Lynn is born. A few months later, she's smothered to death. The Schenectady Police Department would arrest Mary Beth and her husband. Mary Beth confesses to three murders. A motive was never given. Eight children died in her care. We know for sure she murdered three of them. She was sentenced to 20 years to life and she is now a free woman. I just shot my daughter and shot all of my grandkids and I'll be sitting on my step and when you get here, I'm going to do that to myself. Hello, true crimerers. That was part of the 911 call from Don Spirit. Viewer discretion is advised. Just down the turn from this road here is a home in Bell, Florida which is located a little outside of Gainesville. Living at that home was 51-year-old Don Spirit, a man with a criminal background. He once had a felony fugitive warrant, misdemeanor battery charges, drug charges, and depriving a child of food-related charges. This was one of Don's sons back in 2001. His name was Kyle. Now, Don and Kyle were on a hunting trip, and there was an accidental shooting where Kyle was killed. Don was arrested and charged because he was in possession of a firearm and he had already been a felon. 
So Don spent three years in prison for the accidental shooting of his eight-year-old son. Now let's head back to 2014. Also in the house was Don Spirit's daughter, 28-year-old Sarah Lorraine Spirit. She as well had a small criminal background. She was on probation from a 2013 grand theft arrest. Sarah did have a few kids. In fact, Don had several grandchildren, um, just not all from Sarah, of course. In September of 2014, Don and Sarah were both home. There were a few other adults in the house as well, and at least six of the grandkids. Police were familiar with the Spirit household because they had been called there many times. Sarah claimed that he was extremely abusive, that he was violent and a very dangerous person, but also said, you know, I have nowhere to go. Allegedly, Don said, I will make your life a living hell if you call the cops on me again. There was a history of drug use in the house and just a lot of built up anger, aggression, and it all boiled over in September of 2014. Don had issues with one of the great aunts of some of the grandkids. Her name was Colleen Stewart. Don accused Colleen of turning Sarah into a prostitute and turning Sarah into someone he just doesn't like anymore. So he took out a gun, he shot Sarah in the head, then stabbed her six times. He then went through and shot six of his grandkids, including a 10-week-old baby. Colleen Stewart was an aunt to three of the deceased children. Don did it to get back at her. When police arrived after Don called 911, he ended his own life. It's a sick world. Behind the walls of this home in Beeson, Illinois, five dead bodies would be found. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the G family murders. Fewer discretion is advised. The G family was considered like a Brady Bunch style thing because Rick and Ruth had married each other after they had already had children with different spouses. So their blended family consisted of Rick and Ruth, Dylan, Austin, Justina, and Tabitha. Rick also had an older daughter named Nicole who did not live with them. Nicole had an on-again, off-again boyfriend slash ex-husband named Chris Harris. He'll come up later. Some things to point out, their 14-year-old son, Dylan, he was at times considered a bit of a problem child. He would stay up all late hours of the night playing video games, shooters, that kind of thing. And another interesting factoid about the family, Rick and Ruth, they sometimes had threesomes. All after the children were in bed, of course. One of the women they had these little threesomes with was a friend of theirs named Natalie Klein. On the evening of September 20th, 2009, at 10.21 p.m., her and Rick were exchanging instant messages. She said, I just put my kids down to bed. Rick is like, yeah, we're working on the same thing. At 12.37 a.m., now on September 21st, she says, like, oh, I'm so hungry. Rick says, ah, oh, it sucks when that happens this late at night. By 1.04 a.m., the responses from Rick just stopped. At 1.45 a.m., Natalie sent a message that said, you still alive over there? Hauntingly, they weren't. The following morning, the bodies of five of the six individuals inside the G home were found. They had all been beaten to death with a tire iron. The victims were Rick, Ruth, Justina, Austin, and Dylan. Three-year-old Tabitha was also beaten, but she had miraculously survived. Police, they found a very defined shoe print. They found a perfect bloody handprint, which contained DNA not from any member of the G family, so likely the killer. Witnesses said they saw a pickup truck like this drive away from the house sometime between 12.30 and 1.30 a.m. Eventually, they would discover that the truck, the bloody palm print and DNA, and the shoe print all matched Christopher Harris, Nicole G's on-again, off-again lover. At first, he denied having anything to do with the killings. But his brother, Jason, had something else to say. He said that night they had gone out drinking, they were getting high. Nicole wasn't responding to Chris and he wanted to have sex. So he suggested they go to the G home and sexually assault Justina. She was 16 years old. He also suggested they had pot there. Jason says while he waited in the truck, Chris went in and something went wrong and he just bludgeoned the family to death. Chris said, oh, Dylan did all the killing. I saw him do it, so I had to kill Dylan. No. Chris would end up getting five life sentences. Jason got 20 years because he didn't say anything for a while. Hello, true crimers. This is the case known as the wife swap murders. 
Viewer discretion is advised. Now, this case technically doesn't really have anything to do with the show wife swap, but to those who don't know, it's a reality show where families will swap wives for two weeks, usually with two families who are completely opposite. And on season four, the Stockdale family from Ohio would swap with the Tonkovic family from Illinois. The show is made interesting because the fact that usually the families are extremely different. And in this case, the Stockdale family, they lived a life of seclusion. The mother in this story, Kathy, she wanted to protect her boys from, like, any kind of negative influence. So, no television, no music, no video games. And then the Tonkovic family, well, they're the opposite. They're laid back, they play video games, they do all the opposite things. So when Kathy went to that family, she kind of tried to introduce the more secluded life. And when the mom from that family went to their house, she tried to introduce the idea of video games and TV to the kids. And that ended up really frightening the kids. Because they said that if they caught us watching TV, that we're gonna go to hell. So that experiment didn't go great. Anyway, I just say all this so that you have a better understanding of the family. Now, this is 25-year-old Jacob Stockdale. At the time of the show, he was 16. So this story happens much, much later on. Jacob was a bluegrass musician, and this is an image of him back from the wife swap days, but they had a little band. It would consist of the four boys and the father. So they seemed like a happy family, even with all the restrictions. Well, that would all change. In June of 2017, 911 would get a call that was essentially a hang-up. So police sent out some vehicles to that house, the Stockdale house. When they walked towards the house, they heard one gunshot. So that gave them the go-ahead to rush inside. Laying right by the door was 25-year-old Jacob Stockdale. He was bleeding from the head, but he was alive. They then found the dead body of the 54-year-old mother, Kathy. She had been shot dead. They also found his 21-year-old brother, James, also shot dead. The rest of the family was not home. What happened was that Jacob shot his mother, shot his brother, and then tried to end his own life, which he would end up failing doing the last part. After he recovered, he was put into a mental institution for evaluation. He tried to escape twice, failed. The doctors would determine that he was sane at the time of the shootings. What was his motive? The other mom from that wife swap episode blames the strict lifestyle, but James never gave an official motive. He pled guilty and got 30 years to life. Behind the walls of this Australian home, a seemingly normal family lives, but in actuality, it was the home of a monster. Hello, true crimers. This is the case known as the Mornington Monster. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. And a trigger warning, children are involved in this story. This is John Sharp. He was born in 1967 in Mornington, Victoria, which is in Australia. In 1994, he would marry Anna Kemp. She was originally from New Zealand, and they met while working together at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And their family would add one more person in 2002. And that's when their daughter, Gracie, was born. Now, Gracie was born with hip dysplasia. Right from the get-go, she was in treatment. She had to wear a brace for several months. And ultimately, this would cause a lot of nights of crying and screaming, which allegedly took a toll on the married couple. Now, at some point in 2003, John Sharp, he went out and purchased a spear gun. Even though he had never been spearfishing a day in his life and never showed any signs of wanting to. Hi, my name is Mike, and we call that a red flag here in America. What do you guys call it? He seemed to have kept this purchase quiet and didn't let his wife know. Yeah, second, that's a second red flag, yeah. Also in 2003, they would buy this home, and it was located in Mornington. You know, the couple had their rough patches. It was a stressful time trying to take care of their sick daughter. But for the most part, at least on the surface, they looked to be a normal, happy couple. In 2004, great news. Anna was pregnant again, so it's their second child, and this was around when Gracie was about 15 months old. Anna was thrilled. Apparently, John was not. On March 21st, 2004, the family would attend a birthday party. Everyone said, yeah, they seemed normal. No arguments, nothing out of the ordinary. 
Apparently, when they got home from the party, an argument did break out with regards to the new baby. Somewhere around 9 o'clock in the evening, Anna went to bed. This is when John went out to the backyard to retrieve his spear gun. He brought it into the house, pointed it directly at Anna's head, and fired. He did so from just a few centimeters away from her temple, but she was still breathing. So he fired a second spear into her head, which did kill her. The next few days, he took care of Gracie, brought her to daycare, picked her up from daycare. He lied to people about where Anna was, saying that she had an affair and ran off with some man. Her family didn't buy that. On March 27th, he would put Gracie to bed, drink a bunch of alcohol, and then he shot her in the head with a spear gun. It took four spears to kill that little baby. He dismembered them and buried them. By June, he was arrested and confessed. He was sentenced to 33 years to life. A mother frantically searching for her two boys would get a haunting text message from her estranged ex-husband that read, You should have put your family first. Now it's too late. You're so selfish. You're going to live with this the rest of your life. Hello, true crimers. This is the tragic case of Rex and Brody Reinhardt. Paul and Mindy Reinhardt had been going through a divorce. Together, they had two sons, 14-year-old Rex and 11-year-old Brody. By the way, I do want to give you a viewer discretion advice and a trigger warning here. This story does involve self-unaliving. 46-year-old Paul Reinhardt had been going through some issues with depression. He once told his wife that he had issues with inappropriate thoughts entering his brain, but he wasn't getting any actual psychiatric help from anyone. And he never once expressed out loud that he had any thoughts of unaliving himself. Paul is actually the younger brother of a man named Eric von Reinhardt, who was convicted of murder. After he committed that murder, he then tried to unalive himself. In court documents, Paul's brother Eric would be revealed to have been diagnosed with major depressive disorder and anxiety. These types of things can run in the family. On May 4th, 2021, sometime around 5 o'clock in the morning, Paul would post a whole bunch of wedding pictures from his wedding 19 years ago onto his Facebook page. So Mindy Reinhardt then traveled to the Gainesville, Florida home that she used to share with her husband. When she got in, the house was completely empty. Paul was supposed to be there with his two boys. There were hundreds of photographs of the wedding just all over the house. Mindy couldn't get a hold of anyone, so she called 911. Paul would then send a text message to Mindy at 5.39 in the morning, which was this one that I had read at the beginning of this video. And then that was it. That was the last time she ever heard from him. Rex and Brody were huge baseball fans. In fact, they were both actively participating in playing the sport themselves. They were absolutely adored by their teams and loved by everyone in their lives. But with that final text message, Mindy knew something was wrong. She feared for the lives of her sons and her ex-husband. At 6.23 in the morning, Mindy was told that her ex-husband's van was actually at their vacation home in Dixie County, Florida. When everyone got there, it was too late. 7.14 a.m., the vacation home was on fire. When they were able to clear the fire, they would find the dead bodies of both Rex and Brody. They had both been shot to death. Stephen was found dead at the end of his bed. He had ended his own life as well. He had shot and killed his two boys and then deliberately set the fire before taking his own life. The only survivor was their family dog. I cannot stress enough, mental help is everywhere. If you need it, get it. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Amanda Ham. God, this gets depressing after a while. In September of 2003, uh, Amanda Ham here was dating a man by the name of Maurice Legron Jr. And at the time, Amanda, she had three kids. <clears throat> Six-year-old Christopher Ham, three-year-old Austin Brown, and 23-month-old Kylie Ham. Apparently, she wasn't too keen on mothering these children. You see, Amanda, she wanted to move to St. Louis with Maurice. So Amanda asked her mother, hey, can you take custody of two of the kids? And I guess the mother said no. Apparently, Amanda figured out how to resolve that situation. On September 2nd, 2003, Amanda and Maurice were in their 1997 Oldsmobile Cutlass. 
and in the back seat were the three children. Maurice was the one driving the car. He then said he backed the car up down a boat ramp, and this is at Clinton Lake in Illinois. He said he was doing it just to scare the oldest child. You know, like a prank, because he pranked him all the time. Well, he backed it all the way down the ramp. He backed it all the way into the water. Amanda got out of the car. Maurice got out of the car. You know who didn't get out of the car? You know who couldn't get out of the car? These three babies. Do you know who witnessed Amanda and Maurice trying desperately to save these children? No one did. Because they didn't try to save them. Now, I'm not a parent, but I can still understand this. If my child is sitting in the back of a car that is slowly submerging into a body of water, I'm going to do what I can to save these kids. Those two people didn't do anything. Uh, the kids got in the way of whatever lifestyle she wanted to live. Amanda and Maurice were both arrested. They were both charged with the murder of all three children, because yes, all three of them drowned and all three of them died. Other people tried to help, but it was too late. Maurice was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Amanda would only be convicted of child endangerment. She was only sentenced to 10 years. That included time already served. So 18 months later, she was out. Guess what? She got married. Guess what? They had three children together. Guess who's not allowed to do that? Amanda. So the state took the kids away. And now neither of them are ever allowed to have custody of them. The father's sister does, so they get visitation. She tried to hide that shit. Swear to God. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Lester Street Massacre. In early March of 2008, police would enter this Memphis, Tennessee home and they would find an utter nightmare. They would find what appeared to be nine bodies in the house. They would quickly realize that six of those people were dead. Four of them were adults, Cecil Dodson Sr., Marissa Williams, Hollis Seals, and Shindri Robertson. They would also find the body of four-year-old Samario and two-year-old Cecil II. There were three survivors, all of them children. A nine-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-month-old had all been beaten. One of them, named Cecil, he was found in a bathtub, which he had been there for 40 hours. It took a while for people to actually discover the bodies. He had a four and a half inch blade sticking into his skull. The other children also had stab wounds, but the three of them would end up surviving somehow. The house looked like a bloodbath from a movie. There was just carnage everywhere. They found a whole bunch of uh, spent bullets, casings. Virtually every room in the house had blood in it. That's because virtually every room in the house also had bodies in it. You know, they found broken furniture. It really looked like some major struggle happened during all of the shooting and the stabbing. The people who died, they were all shot. The police, they were at a loss. They had no idea who did this because initially they didn't have any tips. They didn't have any real witnesses with the exception of the surviving children, but they were in no condition to talk. That is until a few days later when Cecil, the young man who had a knife sticking out of his head, police were able to ask them, who did this? His answer, Uncle Jesse, or more specifically, Jesse Dotson. He had served time in prison for committing a murder that he had just been out of prison for about seven months when this happened. He was questioned by police initially and he told them, I think this was some sort of gang action. But on March 8th, he broke down and he actually confessed. What happened? Well, he and his brother Cecil were walking back to the house one day. They got into an argument. They were fighting the whole walk home. When they got in the home, he says his brother Cecil reached for a shotgun. That's when he said, I just started shooting. So why everyone else? Why the kids? They were there and they witnessed what I did. I had to eliminate them. And yet six days later, he's uh, confessing to it. So why again did you need to kill everyone? This piece of shit smiled throughout his trial. He got six death sentences. 
Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Jennifer Pan. Viewer discretion is advised. In the late evening hours of November 10th, 2014, Jennifer would make a panicked 911 call. She would tell the 911 operator that several men entered her home, shot her parents, robbed the house, tied her to a banister, and then fled. On that 911 call, you can actually hear the sound of Jennifer's father screaming. Jennifer was born on June 17, 1986 in Markham, Ontario, Canada. She was born to Vietnamese parents Hue Han Pan and Bic Ha Pan. They were very strict parents by all accounts and they had high expectations for their children. They put Jennifer in piano lessons at age four and they had her in ice skating classes at a very young age where she would practice literally every single day. Her parents would be described as traditional tiger parents. Jennifer would tell her parents that she was working towards her degree from the University of Toronto and that she was a volunteer at the hospital for sick children. All of this would be lies. Her parents would become suspicious after a while and one day her mother followed her to her job and realized that there was no hospital job. Jennifer's father at this point wanted to kick her out of the house. Jennifer was also dating Daniel Chi Kwong Wong, which eventually her parents would forbid her from seeing him even when she was at the age of 24. On the evening of November 8th, 2010, Jennifer would unlock her front door and then go to bed. This would be when David Milvaganam entered the house, along with Lenford Crawford, Eric Sniper Carty, and Jennifer's on-again, off-again boyfriend, Daniel Wong. When police was asking her what happened, Jennifer said that the men ransacked the house, stole things, allegedly, then took both her parents down to the basement, where they then shot both parents. Jennifer's mother was killed on scene. Her father would survive. Whoops. She then claimed the men tied her to the banister upstairs, where she managed to pull her cell phone out of her back pocket and call 911, something she had to demonstrate in one of her many interrogations. Turns out Jennifer had worked with these four men, planned to murder her parents, in which she promised to pay $10,000 and then would inherit half a million dollars and give them more money. She would briefly try to tell cops that the plan was to actually kill her, not her parents, because she didn't want to live. This was a lie. Her father would request at her trial that she be permanently banned from ever speaking to him or anyone ever again in their family. Good for him. She, along with her accomplices, would all be convicted and sentenced to 25 years to life. Tisk tisk tisk. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Roxanne Severcool. She is sever not cool. <laughs> nope. Oh well, too bad you can't erase things. I am having a heck of a time finding any really good photos for this, but we'll make two. Nah, here's a better picture. Roxanne was born in October of 1962. Her and her family lived in Susquehanna County in Pennsylvania. And this is her boyfriend at the time, Robert Fadden. On the night of August 19th, 1980, going into the morning of August 20th, 1980, Roxanne and her boyfriend Robert would enter Roxanne's house. And Roxanne, by the way, was 17 years old at the time of this. And Robert Fadden was 24. Anyway, they entered the home that night and armed with a 22 caliber rifle, they shot and killed 43-year-old Lester Severcool, Roxanne's father, 38-year-old Mary Severcool, Roxanne's mother, and 10-year-old Ted Severcool, Roxanne's brother. They also shot Roxanne's other brother, James, in the head, but he survived. James would eventually regain consciousness, they think, a day or so later. He would crawl out to the front of the house, and this is when a mail carrier, this gentleman here, saw him um, clinging to life on the front lawn. He said James's eye was just completely gone. The authorities then knew who was responsible for the shooting, and then a nationwide hunt began. But it wouldn't be long until they found Roxanne and Robert. They were both arrested and charged with three counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. In 1981, Roxanne and Robert would both have their own individual trials, and both were convicted of all counts. 
Roxanne was given three life sentences without the possibility of parole, and Robert Fadden got the same exact thing. Fast forward roughly 36 years later. The Supreme Court had recently ruled that any minor under the age of 18 who had been convicted of homicide that it would be unconstitutional to make them serve a life sentence without parole. That anyone who was sentenced as a minor should have the possibility of parole. So, in 2016, Roxanne Severcool was released. One of the conditions of her parole is that she is not allowed to have any contact with any remaining Severcool family members. She is also not allowed to ever step foot in Susquehanna County. But. Roxanne was given a second chance at life. I just wish we could say the same thing for her family members that were gunned down. Just me? Okay. Hello, true... True crimers. <laughs> this, this is the case of uh, Joel Guy Jr. It's a, a pleasure to um, uh, flee from you. <laughs> um... Joel here was born on March 13th, 1988. He was living in his own apartment in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. His parents, Joel Guy Sr. and Lisa Guy, well, they were very supportive of Joel Jr. Like, they literally financially supported the man. Joel Jr. had traveled to their home in Knoxville, Tennessee for the Thanksgiving holiday in 2016. Joel Jr. was there with his three half-sisters, who were daughters of Joel Sr. from another marriage, and they enjoyed a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday on November 24th, 2016. You see, the parents had just sold their home, and the parents were planning to retire to a little city called Segoinsville. But they wouldn't get to do that. A couple days after the holiday, um, Lisa Guy's employers would call the police. They would ask them to do a wellness check on Lisa and her husband because she hadn't come back to work and they couldn't get a hold of her. So police went to the house. From the windows, they could see some groceries on the floor. Well, groceries that may look like a murder kit. Police would also detect a really foul odor coming from the home. One of the cars was in the driveway and one of the officers managed to press the garage door opener, which then opened the garage. This is when they would enter the house. Once inside the house, they saw a sledgehammer sitting on top of one of the counters, and they also found a gun, and a pot on the stove that was currently boiling. They then heard their dog barking upstairs, so when police went up there, they would discover the dismembered hands of one of the parents. And then they would find parts of their corpses in two separate bins in a acid solution bath. In the pot boiling was Lisa Guy's decapitated head. They then uncovered a murder list, which would show that Joel Guy Jr., in great detail, wrote out and planned the murder of his parents. Pause and read that if you can. Here's more of his wonderful little list. In the investigation, they found CCTV footage of Joel Guy Jr. buying all of the supplies. And here he is again, purchasing it. And, <gasps> shh, don't move. His vision's based on movement. He had defensive wounds everywhere. Why did he do it? Money. What did he get? Life in prison. I flick you, meh, bug. You son of a motherless. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Toothman family from Chesapeake, Virginia. On August 7th, 2016, the police would be called to the Toothman residence. When police arrived, there were two dead bodies inside the house. One of the victims was Michael Toothman, a 30-year veteran of the Chesapeake Police Department. The other victim was 17-year-old Matthew Toothman. The father and son had both been shot to death. The mother, Susie Toothman, had also been shot in the head, but she survived. The only one not shot Zachary Toothman. I'll give you one good guess as to why he wasn't shot. You got it? You figure it out? Yeah, he was the shooter. Zachary was a student at Virginia Tech. Well, sometime before this incident, he was placed on academic leave. He was described as a people pleaser, and that would cause him significant amounts of stress, 
He also suffered from depression. He caved into pressure really easily. He couldn't make decisions on his own. In fact, back in 2016, kind of all of this boiled up for him and he tried to take his own life. He was treated um, and the doctor said this was likely a one-time incident. I'm not sure how you could possibly know that, but... Well, the family decided against medicating him. This was because one of the side effects of one of the drugs they wanted to prescribe was suicidal thoughts. I get it, it makes sense. But all of his mental health issues started to ramp up again, which helped lead to his academic leave. He ended up ruining his relationship with his girlfriend. And when he came home for the summer from Virginia Tech, he didn't even tell his parents that he was put on academic leave. Well, now on August 7th, 2017, Zach's parents were trying to, you know, get stuff together to get him back to Virginia Tech, again, not knowing he couldn't go back. His mother told him to go get his laptop so they can start registering for classes. And a few minutes after going upstairs, the parents suddenly heard two popping noises, which were the sounds of Zachary, who had taken his father's service pistol and shot his brother twice in the head while he was playing video games. The parents rushed upstairs. Zachary came out into the hallway, shot his father in the arm. They struggled, got into a fight. Zachary basically won, and then he fired another shot into his father, killing him. But not before his father said, Zachary, I love you. He then shot his mother in the back of the head, but did not kill her. But she played dead. She ran out to the streets, and then Zachary noticed, and he started screaming, Mom, why did you kill the family? But no one bought that. He pled guilty to two counts of murder and attempted murder. The judge said it was premeditated, but there was also no reason for it. He got two life sentences. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Bain family murders. And for this one, we are going to New Zealand. Don't worry, I won't butcher your accent. Robin and Margaret pictured there on the bottom right. They would marry in 1969 in Dunedin, New Zealand. And they would go on to have four children. David, Stephen, Arawa, and Laniette. They lived in this pretty good-sized home in Anderson's Bay in Dunedin, New Zealand. Robin and Margaret by now were kind of estranged. David, the oldest child pictured on the far right there, he had a part-time job delivering newspapers. In the early morning hours of June 20th, 1994, David would enter the home after his newspaper delivery job. And at 7.09 a.m. that morning, he called 111, which is their 911. He just told the operator, they're dead. They're all dead. Every other member of the Bain family, obviously excluding David, were shot dead throughout the home. Police would find a typed note on the computer that said, sorry, you were the only one that deserved to stay. Four days after the family murder, the police arrested David Bain and charged him with five counts of murder. The belief being that David wanted the inheritance money, so he killed his entire family. To police, it seemed like a pretty open and shut thing. And David would go on trial for their murders in May of 1995. They would say that David shot his entire family and then did his newspaper run. And David Bain was found guilty of all five counts of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison and was given the possibility of parole after 16 years. And that's our story. Except it's not. This is former rugby player Joe Karam. He was extremely passionate that David Bain did not commit these murders. And because of his support, shedding light that there was prosecutorial misconduct, that the courts abused their powers by not allowing certain witnesses to testify, David Bain was given a retrial in 2009. You see, shortly before the family murders, one of their daughters, Laniette, she was going to confront her father, Robin, and tell the entire family that he was sexually assaulting her as a child. He was committing incest with her. And new witnesses would come forward stating that they for sure saw David Bain on his newspaper run during the time the murders were supposed to take place. And David Bain, he was acquitted. This is him now. He served 13 years for a murder that in all likelihood, his creeper father over here committed, fearing the exposure that Laniette was about to bring forth. So he shot three of his kids and his wife and left a note saying that David was the only one he wanted to live. Family, am I right? Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Pizza Plus 
murders. And viewer discretion is advised. March 30th, 2009, Tazewell, Virginia. An employee of the local Pizza Plus restaurant would open the store to find two dead bodies. The body of 52-year-old Harvey Looney and his 48-year-old wife, Valerie Looney. Harvey's throat was cut, and the authorities reported that they found Valerie nearly decapitated. Her throat had been cut very, very badly. She also had some blunt force trauma to her head. Police would quickly discover that Valerie's head was hit with a fire extinguisher. No, not this one. Whoever struck her in the head, uh, they left the blood on the fire extinguisher and then put it back into its little holder. Police suspected from the get-go that this was some sort of inside job. And they thought that they could actually get DNA off of the fire extinguisher, which they did, but the results for it came back inconclusive and didn't match anyone. The morning they were found was actually the 29th wedding anniversary for them. That's really fucking sad. This is Christopher Looney. He actually lived with his parents, and he would be questioned right away. And the reason why is because his parents didn't come home after closing up the pizza shop. And police found it very strange that he just didn't seem to care. He would say, well, you know, their anniversary was the next day, so, you know, they probably just went out and did something. He would claim that, yeah, I don't, I don't think they had any enemies. I'm not sure who would have done this. Well, lo and behold, enter our best friend, life insurance policy. Yep, the loonies had one. And guess who would stand to benefit the most? Christopher Looney. But he continued to deny, deny, deny he had anything to do with it. And police had no actual evidence connecting him to the murder itself. Four years goes by and they have nothing. They seem pretty convinced it's Christopher, but they can't connect him to it. So this is when police, they bring in an interrogation company. I didn't even know that existed. They use something called the Reed Analysis Technique, which blends fact analysis, behavior analysis, and the Reed Nine Steps of Interrogation. They brought Christopher back in, and they just said, listen, we know you had something to do with their murder. And lo and behold, he confessed. He said it was just an accident, okay? That's a pretty involved accident there, bud. He said he was there at 10.30 p.m. the night of their murder. They got into an argument, and I guess he somehow accidentally slit his mother's throat. He then ran behind his father and choked him to death, and then slit his throat afterwards. Then he beat his mother's head in with a fire extinguisher because she was still moving, and he was set to get $240,000 out of it. He pleaded no contest and was given a life sentence. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Amityville House. And no, we are not going to talk about the popular series of films that was based on the Lutz family in the 70s claiming the house was haunted by gurus and demons and goblins. Which, by the way, that true story was proven to be a hoax, if you did not know. So most of you know that part of the story, but a lot of you guys don't know about the actual murders that took place in the Amityville home. So let's go. Viewer discretion is advised. November 13th, 1974, somewhere around 6.30 p.m., 23-year-old Amityville, Long Island, New York resident Ronald DeFeo Jr. runs into a bar called Henry's Bar, screaming, You've got to help me! I think my mother and father have been shot! So concerned, a group of his friends run out of the bar, and they hurry over to 112 Ocean Avenue, to the DeFeo home, where Ronald DeFeo Jr. lived with his parents and his four siblings. The friends enter the home, and upstairs they find the dead bodies of Ronald DeFeo Jr.'s parents. Both of them were shot dead. So they immediately call the police. And when the police enter the home, they again found the bodies of Ronald DeFeo Sr. and Louise DeFeo, each shot twice. And they also found the 18-year-old sister of Ronald DeFeo Jr., Dawn, shot once. His 13-year-old sister, Allison, shot once. His 12-year-old brother, Mark, shot once. And finally, his 9-year-old brother, John DeFeo Jr., shot once. All six family members were deceased. All shot with a 34 caliber rifle. That same evening, Ronald would tell the police that he thinks it was a hitman who did it. He even gave him a name. Oh, Louis Fellini. That sounds really mobby, if you ask me. So the police go to verify Fellini's whereabouts. Guess what? He's not even in the same state. So that theory was shot down. 
Ronald DeFeo Jr. here would continue changing his story like little inconsistencies here and there. Enough that it really concerned the police. And they had to wonder, why were you the only survivor of this massacre? Where were you? Well, the following morning, he couldn't keep it in anymore. Ronald DeFeo Jr. confessed to the murders of his entire family. He said, and I quote, Once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. So he was charged with six counts of murder. October 14th, 1975, his trial began. He tried to plead insanity. He said he did it in self-defense because he heard his family's voices plotting against him. Not true. The psychiatrist would say that he was well aware of his actions and knew what he was doing. And he knew that it was wrong. November 21st, 1975, he was convicted of six counts of murder. And he got six life sentences and he died in prison. And oh, that's a ghost in the house. <laughs> Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Carpentier murders. And I very much said that wrong, I apologize. But I can't, I can't pronounce French names. And of course, viewer discretion is advised. This story takes place on July 8th, 2020 in Quebec, Canada. 44-year-old father, Martin Carpentier, oh, sorry. He had taken his two daughters, 11-year-old Nora and six-year-old Romy. They went out to get ice cream, yum. Everything seemed completely normal with Martin. He was showing absolutely no signs of any kind of odd behavior. He was divorced from his wife, the mother of their two children, but they had a very friendly relationship and he was described as a very loving, caring father. He loved his girls. But on July 8th, 2020, something happened. Martin and his two girls were driving east on a highway near Quebec City. When suddenly the car skidded, it hit a median and then it flipped a couple of times on the highway. And it actually landed on the other side of the road. When Quebec authorities arrived, there was no one in the car. The father, the two girls, nowhere to be seen. Witnesses said they saw Martin take the girls out of the car. He had one of them over his shoulders, she was alive, um, and the other one was walking, um, holding his hand. Now, the mother of the two girls was obviously very distraught about this, but she said her ex-husband wouldn't be a danger to the two girls. So an Amber Alert wasn't even issued until the following day on July 9th. Unfortunately, it wouldn't really matter because the two girls would be found bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument in the woods, uh, kind of nearby where the accident happened. But Martin was nowhere to be found. Quebec authorities called in, uh, you know, helicopters to search from the sky. They had lane searches with dogs, and they just kept searching and searching for Martin. Some neighbors reported that they had a ladder missing and a shovel missing. And then on July 16th, 2020, in the area where the homes were, where those missing objects came from, they then found the dead body of Martin. Trigger warning, just a heads up. Okay. Martin had ended his own life. Police believed when they issued the Amber Alert, all three people were already dead. It is believed by authorities that the car accident was absolutely not intentional, that it was a genuine accident. And there were signs that Martin actually tried to recontrol the car. But then after that, no one knows what happened. This one is super mysterious to me because I can't see any reason as to why he would murder his two girls. He had no history of violence. Like I said, he was considered a loving father, a loving husband. He was still in great contact with his ex-wife. He had just taken his girls to get ice cream. So why would he kill them? Like, what happened? It's just so bizarre and weird to me. Like, I can't find any motives anywhere. So weird.